And good evening, everyone. We're so glad to have you here as part of, again, the second webinar of our 2024 Rural Resilience Series. Now, this is the fourth year that we've used this platform to bring specific ag education to our community. We're excited about this year's lineup. Our first webinar was last month that featured Matthew McQuaig of Cattle Facts. Now, I know I learned a ton with his insight into the cattle market. If you missed it, not a big deal. We do still have his information uploaded and on our Ranchers Stewardship Alliance YouTube page. Angel DeVries, who is our executive director, is serving as tech support tonight, and she's dropping that link to the YouTube channel in the chat here for this. So go there, check it out, hit subscribe. We'd love to have some more subscribers onto our YouTube channel. Still coming up for Rural Resilience this year, we've got Montana State University's Dr. Julia Hagerty joining us. She'll be Thursday, March 28th. And I've never heard Dr. Hagerty present, but I've heard that it is tremendous. She talks about community resilience. She talks about the, uh, the footprint of natural resources within rural communities. And with our discussion next month, she's going to be saying why resilience is a concept to embrace with caution. And then in April, Thursday, April 25th, we're going to have Jesse Olson, Abby Majerus, and Mariah Shamel. They're the co-creators and the owners of Montana Ranch Hers Beef Co. And uh, they're presenting on selling beef direct to consumer when deep freezers are plenty and processors not so much. So kind of a, a realistic look at direct beef marketing when we don't live in a really urban area. Some housekeeping tonight. Now, there are a lot of people on this call, so go ahead, turn off your cameras, keep those off. That'll help the video feed to not get bogged down tonight. Upon entry, your microphone was already muted, so please pay attention to keep it that way. Towards the end of the webinar, there is going to be a Q&A session, and that'll be run via the text chat feature, so no reason to flip your, your microphone back on. So as we get into tonight, who are we, who am I, and why are we bringing you this webinar? Well, I am Haley Ship, the Communications and Outreach Lead with the Ranchers Stewardship Alliance. This webinar is one of our educational products. A rancher founded, rancher ran nonprofit. We started in 2003. We've got a board of volunteer ranchers. Physically, our office is located in Malta, north central Montana, and then we're getting a stronger physical hold into Valley County, where yours truly is sitting right now in downtown Glasgow, and we also are currently hiring in Glasgow with another position. And you can learn more about our organization at our website, and Angel's dropping that into the chat as well, ranchstewards.org. So as we talk about what we do within the Ranchers Stewardship Alliance, we really excel in showcasing how responsible ranching is good for rural communities, as well as the wildlife habitat that we support, constantly working with non-traditional partners to provide support, monetary and otherwise, to ranchers that want to improve infrastructure. And while we geographically have some limits with our conservation projects, our educational branch within the Ranchers Stewardship Alliance knows no bounds. Part of the vision that we have is believing in a future where ranching and rural communities are so successful in the Northern Great Plains that ranch families never need to consider selling or transitioning their land out of production agriculture. That's really important to us. So we stand wholeheartedly with that mission and believe that just like any industry continuing education only adds to the strength. That's why we're here tonight. Before I introduce our speaker, we are going to dive into three pitches from the Ranchers Stewardship Alliance. So if you enjoy what you've heard here this evening, I know none of these will be hard sells. Uh, we do have, of course, a Facebook page within RSA, kind of a given in this day and age. But uh, since you're here on the call, I'm going to just let you know, you're going to be first to know that we are going to be doing a swag giveaway contest early in March. So make sure to hop on, give us a like and get ready for that. Again, that's on the Ranchers Stewardship Alliance Facebook page, that link in the chat. Number two, we started a podcast. It's called the Ranch Stewards Podcast. I'm the host. And to make it a bit more dynamic of a conversation, it is me, a guest, and then also a staff or a board member that's joining as the guest host for each episode. It's available on all of your major platforms forms for podcasts, as well as our website. And that link is going into your chat. And then lastly, we have one big 
in-person educational event that's coming up on Monday, March 4th. So we're about a week and a half away. It'll be at the Milk River Pavilion in Malta featuring Steve Campbell of Taylor Made Cattle. It's going to be a two-part workshop. You can attend the morning, the afternoon, or the full day. And the morning is going to be a presentation that's titled Minerals, Toxin Minerals Toxins, and Ranch Epigenetics. And uh, from Steve, he says, in an increasingly challenging agricultural landscape, the issue of abundant toxins from neighboring sources and the deficiency of vital minerals in our soils poses a significant hurdle for livestock to thrive and meet their full genetic potential for productivity. During this session, Steve will be challenging attendees to think outside the box in, term of, in terms of cattle mineral delivery and acceptance. And then his afternoon presentation is the one that I'm a little bit more familiar with, and this is the Red Solo Cup Cow. It's something that Steve has been doing for a number of years now, and you'll be learning more about the unique method of identifying healthy, easy-keeping cattle that Steve swears by, their resemblance to Red Solo Cups, by identifying specific physical attributes that resemble the shape of these cups. He explains how to improve animal selection for increased herd efficiency, fertility, and profit within sustainable ranching operations. His approach highlights how healthy, resilient animals like the red solo cup cow not only contribute to enhanced profitability within ranching operations, but also promote a more sustainable and resilient agricultural landscape. Now, this portion of the day does include a live cattle demonstration, the donation of the cattle use from Dusty Emond and Emond Ranch. I know Dusty's on the call tonight, so thank you for, for donating the use of your cattle. And we've got the sign-up link for that in our chat. Again, it's coming up on Monday, March 4th. All right, with no further ado, let's get into tonight's presentation. Carmen Salveson is a fifth-generation rancher, mom of four, online nursing instructor for MSU Northern, and self-proclaimed self crazy goat lady. When she isn't trying to get the goats back in, some favorite pastimes include killing plants in her garden, boating, and camping. The Little Rockies and Gates of the Mountains are some favorite destinations. Carmen has been married 14 years to her husband, Wes. Their four kids are Lucy, Nellie, Dottie, and Monty. They live five miles from Malta, where Alkali Creek converges with the Milk River. Carmen has spent most of her life in Malta. After graduating from high school in 2008, she moved to Haver, attending MSU Northern for nursing. She then worked for several years as a registered nurse at Bullhook Community Health Center. Carmen attended University of Phoenix online and obtained her master's degree of nursing. And since then, she has taught online courses for MSU Northern's Bachelor of Nursing program. Carmen and Wes moved back to Malta in 2015 to ranch and raise their kids close to family. They have together worked with Carmen's family ranch business, D&K Livestock. All right, Carmen, self-proclaimed goat lady, the floor is yours. Thank you, Haley. Thanks everyone for joining. I hope uh, what I have to share is helpful for you tonight. So let's get into this. Okay. So bottom of your Zoom screen. Is that right? Nope. You gotta do the share screen. Hold on. Yep. Yep. Share screen. Carmen has our tech support in house tonight. She's doing this from the RSA office. So. Yep. And then <laughs> there. There we go. Angel got me going now here. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so uh, we got goats about five years ago, and I'm just going to kind of go through how that started and some of the lessons we've learned around the way, along the way that probably would have been helpful um, to me when we started. So it's kind of our setup. So why goats? That's something we get asked quite a lot. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure how uh, it first got brought up. Um, but hold on just a second. I got to move that something here for me. Sorry. Um, it was at a time that calf prices were down and expenses were up and we were just looking for, um, ways that we could maybe do something a little bit different than we had done before. Um, we got to a point that we were willing to try something that was maybe unconventional um, that not a lot of people utilize in our area. Um, but we got to that point that we were willing to go for it. So another big why for us was the river place that we bought. Wes and I bought this place in 2017. It's about 400 acres and it's on the Milk River and where Alkali Creek dumps into the Milk River. So um, 
you can see that uh, our bend goes up and around and there is a fence on it that um, with not a lot of gates um, and we tried to use it with our cows, but it, it wasn't very successful. They didn't like how steep it was. They didn't like how narrow it was in places. So we thought that the goats would be really suited to that, um, as well as this part along Alkali Creek. Also, we do have some leafy spurge along it, and what we had read and hoped would be that the goats would help control that. Um, another why is there's a pretty high demand for goat meat. It's one of the most imported meats in the US. Um, that helps the market stay pretty strong. It's very nutritious also, which I know it's not always necessarily part of our everyday diet around this um, part of the state, but it is a good healthy meat. Okay, so a few breeds of goats, when we started looking at it, we kind of researched, and this is not an all-inclusive list, but um, just worth mentioning. We decided... Um, to go with meat goats, not dairy goats. Um, Boers, Kiko, Spanish, and Savannah are kind of some common ones in the area, although that's not an all-inclusive list. And some common dairy varieties are Nub Nubian, La Mancha, Sanin, and Nigerian Dwarf. Those are goats that you kind of see for sale around. Um, if you're gonna have meat goats, I would um, just be cautious of starting off with dairy varieties just because uh, it's pretty obvious when they come to the, in the sale ring with their ears, uh, sometimes you get dinged for that. If you wanna start with dairy and do that part too, that's great, but just kind of know that before. So our plan that we kind of made after researching it was we wanted, we decided we wanted to get Boer, Kiko and Spanish cross goats. And our plan was to breed the does um, to kid in the springtime. And then in the fall, we would take the kids, once they had grown, to Pays and Billings, which is a couple hundred miles south of us. Um, we wanted to have pretty minimal input to make them profitable. We didn't want to have a lot of um, money going into them. We wanted to be keep it as low key as we could. Um, and with that, we found our first goats on Craigslist and we traveled and got them from Lincoln and Helena area. And we got 10 Spanish Boer Cross nanny goats. They weren't anything fancy. Um, there was a guy that was had them just to help control the weeds on his property. Um, their job was to eat spotted knapweed. And he was just kind of selling some of them to decrease his herd size. And then we got a Kiko buckling. So with that, we started our goat journey. I'm just going to kind of go through the last five years and some noteworthy um, things that happened through that time. So our very first mistake was having only one buck and trying to keep him separated from the does. They are very, very social animals. Um, with the exception of if you have a bottle baby or a pet goat, you probably need to plan to have at least two in a pen if you're gonna separate them by themselves. Um, it's pretty stressful on them. He was crying and trying to escape. Thankfully, we had some friends that gave us a weather to live with him and that helped a lot. <laughs> but don't try to just have one goat and separate it from the rest of your goats. That did not work out well for us. Um, I'm gonna end up talking about fencing quite a bit throughout this presentation because for us, this has been the biggest challenge by far. Um, they like, goats like to wander while they eat. Um, they browse around instead of grazing, um, which means they like to move and sample various uh, plants along the way. They all stay together. They don't usually spread out really far on a pasture. Um, there's usually a boss doe or a herd queen, we call them, and she sets the tone of where and what they're gonna eat. And if that bossy doe um, wants to eat weeds on the other side of the fence, the whole herd will usually follow her right through. Um, so you can see here in these first pictures of the goats, they're in the yard. That is not where they're supposed to be. <laughs> Our buck ended up letting himself out of his um, pen. And we at first had him in like a chain link type panel, panel and that did not work. He used his horns, um, they'll push on latches, they'll pull up on wires with their horns. 
and they can get through a very small space when they're motivated. So he ended up letting himself out a little bit earlier than we wanted, but we kind of went with it at that point. I think when we started, we put up three strands of electric fence and thought we'd try that, see how that went. Well, it didn't work at all. Um, we went to four and then five, and we really didn't have a lot of luck even with five strands. It didn't slow them down at all. And some of our issue was grounding at that time. Um, we got them in a time when the ground was frozen and uh, we had a hard time getting a good charge on it too. But the fencing is to be continued in later years, but this was our first experience and that definitely was not enough for keeping them in. So our first babies, when we got our goats, it turned out two of the 10 goats were already bred. So we had some surprises coming our way when we brought them home. Um, turns out we weren't the only ones who were having trouble keeping our buck in. Um, it was quite the surprise for us. We thought we still had a couple months to prepare for baby goats. Um, our goat Eclipse on the top, the black one, had a single baby, and our goat Badger had twins. Um, and we let them be mama goats and take the lead on what to do, and it's treated us very well. They were excellent mothers, and considering the weather was pretty cold for newborns, it went very smooth. Baby goats are only about six, seven, eight pounds when they're born, and it was a pretty cold night, and they did fine. They're pretty hardy little guys. So um, I also wanted to mention that they both kitted the same night, and nothing else was bred early, and the remainder were from our buck. So I'm guessing that the people that we got them from had a buck that got out for one day and bred multiple does, and they stay really tight to their due date. Okay, so kidding take two. So here's our plan kidding now. Um, in May and June, the rest of the goats kitted. Um, these babies were Kiko and Spanish crosses. We had mostly twins and it went very well. Um, we had a couple singles, um, seven sets of twins and one that was dry. The one that was dry we suspected was younger. So, and that was why she didn't get bred. So we decided to end up keeping her that year anyway. Um, we ended our first kidding with 10 goats and 16 babies. And we adjusted to the mother goats stashing their babies in all the little hidey holes they could find and sometimes separated from each other. But overall, we found our goats to be really good mothers and that kidding usually is um, goes pretty smoothly. Uh, during the summer, we did have a baby die from what we suspected was overeating. And at that point, we decided to um, use the CD&T vaccination on them. So we the protocol is, um, for us anyway, our protocol is we give them a, a shot when they're born within like the first few days of life. And then they get a two shot series 30 days apart in their first year of life and then annual boosters thereafter. We try to time our annual booster to be as close to kidding as we can, um, but like within the few, a few weeks because they can get a little bit of passive immunity to kids that way. Um, one thing that set us up pretty well this first year was that we didn't start with a huge amount of animals. We had 10 um, and they really got us used to some of the differences that we were trying to compare um, to cows. So some of the different fencing needs, some of the different health issues um, that we were used to with cows. If you are used to sheep, we've ne we had never had sheep before. Um, you might be able to start a little bit bigger if you have that infrastructure in place. But if you don't, I think starting small is really a must. Um, if you have no history of caring for goats, I wouldn't recommend starting with more than 20. You'll be able to learn a lot without having a lot of your money invested It'll mitigate your financial risk and um, any issues that arise. Cause I'm sure like us, mistakes will be made along the way. Okay, so that was kind of the conclusion of some of the lessons in the first year. So that brought us to year two. Okay, first fresheners. So at this point going into our second herd, we had had eight of our original herd still. Um, we had one die and we sold one. Um, we bought another Boer Black and we bought 13 more, just kind of mixed a little bit of a variety of goats. We decided to breed our dolings. So these were the ones that were born um, in May and June. We had eight females that we kept and we decided to breed them. We had read about it 
and we decided um, to try it. And it's probably, if you read on some of the goat groups, a little bit of a controversial thing, but we breed them at seven months old and then they'll kid at 12 months old. Um, and we've had really good luck with it. Um, when we first put the buck in with the goats, though, we were like, Wes and I looked at each other and we're like, there's no way this is going to work. But it is. And half of the eight had twins and half of them had singles. So the reason some people, it's kind of controversial. Some people say that you can have a lot of dystocia or kidding problems on those young goats because they're not big enough. But in our five years of having goats, we've probably kitted close to 100 goats at one year of age. And we've only had to assist or like pull or reposition one of those. So it's very, very much the oddity. Most of them have their kids unassisted without problems. Um, these animals do end up having a lot of nutritional needs because they're still growing and they're growing babies. So I'd say good feed throughout their whole pregnancy is definitely important. Um, we found that they do really fine on mothering at this age. Very rarely have we had triplets off of a first time mom um, and they are able to keep track of their twins or single really pretty well. So. We also haven't found that it stunts them. Some people will say it'll stunt them. Um, I still have seven out of eight of these first females um, on our property and they're all grown and they're not stunted at all. Most of them ended up being a little bit larger than their mothers were even. Some people think longevity can be affected. And honestly, I haven't been going long enough to give you a, a clear answer on that. Um, if we had to guess the ages on our first goats, by the time they're eight, they start to be showing some of their age um, with graying hair. Um, we had one that had poor teeth by that age that we sold because of her teeth and body condition. Um, but to us, the profitability is was really important with the goats and getting that first kid crop off of the dolings um, by the time they're one, I think has been really worth it and has gone well for us. Okay, so mites and lice. Another thing that we encountered in the first, this next year was in the winter and early spring, late winter, early spring, um, they tend, we've had a few times that they've gotten mites. Um, we usually end up spraying them now with like a cleanup to get rid of those around this time of year. One case was really bad and her name was Mighty. And then this case was really almost deadly and we call her super mites still, but don't worry, this goat number 44, lovely little super mites had triplets last year and she is just fine. We thought she was gonna die, um, but instead she had a baby. So she did good, but you can't, I didn't have a good picture showing how bad she looked for a little while, but um, she was losing hair on her legs and you can kind of see around her ear how rough it is. And it's like really scabbed from um, the mites. So. That was another thing that we found to do to just kind of prevent problems was to spray them with the cleanup. Okay, dumb ways to die. Our neighbor who has goats described them as the smartest, stupidest animals you will ever meet. And I think that's a pretty accurate description. They are very athletic and they enjoy climbing to the highest point they can find and then jumping around. Now, some dangerous things can be mitigated and others unfortunately can't. So a few dangerous things that have happened to our goats. Hog panels, we learned the hard way not to use hog panels to try to keep goats out of anywhere. It, they're just too short and they will try to jump them and oftentimes they can, but then we had one that hung her leg on it and it basically amputated her leg and she subsequently died. Um, flatbed trailers are another danger. Actually, this little goat looking at us here broke his leg on a flatbed trailer. Um, they will get up on the deck and run around. And then when they run and go to jump off, uh, they step in the gap between the decking and the metal where the side panels can go and break their legs. We had one up on the hydro bed, did the same thing. And that basically amputated her leg too. And she had to be put down. Now trees are something that can't really be controlled. The goats love to stand on their back legs and eat leaves. Um, and we had one that climbed up on a stump and then got her leg stuck in a fork of a tree and couldn't get her feet back under her. And so she died there. Some fencing can be uh, a little bit dangerous. We've used electric netting and I love it, but I hate it. And I hate it for the reason we have had a few strangle 
themselves in it. A couple tried to go underneath it where there was like a change in the terrain. Um, so then we only will use it on flat areas now is our strategy, but we did have one even on a flat area. I'm not sure if something spooked it and it tried to run through or what. So um, they can kind of tend to get themselves in a little bit of trouble. Um, we also have woven wire. They, there's kind of a time frame on woven wire, um, especially when they're about six months old to about 12 months old, they can get their head through the hole, but they can't get them back out. So you got to really watch them at that age to make sure that they don't get themselves stuck. Okay, nutrition. So the myth is that goats will eat anything. And I suppose to a degree that's true. They'll maybe take a bite out of most anything, but they're actually pretty picky eaters. <laughs> um, they like to browse and they like to eat a large variety of food. Um, so this year we had a group of goats um, that we decided to use some older hay on. And it just wasn't as much nutrition as they needed. And we ended up having babies born that had some weak legs, um, especially triplets were affected. So this was our first set of triplets that we had born. It's Eclipse, the goat that had the single in the first year. She had triplets. Um, this, the one in the middle, this buckling, you can kind of see his legs are splayed out. He couldn't leave and stand up at first. Um, Thankfully, this mama goat was really good with him. Uh, you can see his sister over here had really very bendy legs. Um, so this mama though was very good. She would go over, I would watch her. She would get her muzzle on him and she would get him on to nurse. And within a couple days, the sister was fine. And within less than a week, uh, the buckling was fine too. So that's this picture here. Here, she, this is the buckling standing up and doing well. And these two are his sisters and they're well too. And they're still actually, uh, I still have both of them and they are doing well. So what I read was selenium deficiency is actually kind of part of that. Um, some people will try to brace if they have goats with legs like this, but honestly, they come out of it pretty fast. We haven't braced anything and they come out of it pretty quickly. I, there's also selenium paste that you can get for newborns. We haven't used that either. Really what we just make sure to do is we really bolster their nutrition in the final weeks of their pregnancy. And then since we've done that, we've had very few cases of that. So they have pretty high nutritional needs um, in the end of their pregnancy. Okay, so some more talking about fencing. This is my two-year-old daughter. And if you're fencing on the riverbank, you get to wear a life jacket if mom is uh, preoccupied with putting fence up. So there's Dottie with her life jacket. Um, so what we did, this was at our river place and on our riverbank, um, we had a four strand barbed wire fence. And what we decided to try to do was to add two electric wires to the four strand barbed wire fence. And spoiler alert, that was not good enough. So they would stay in a little bit with that, but as soon as they got the urge to wander or in the mood for a certain plant on the other side of the fence, they would push through it. They would just uh, sneak through fast so they hopefully wouldn't get shocked. Um, I put in a lot of high tensile wire and I really like it. You'd need some sort of spinning Jenny or other device um, to unroll it so that it unrolls uh, correctly and doesn't end up looking like a telephone cord. Um, it carries a charge really well and it's pretty cost effective if you're putting it over a lar large area. So um, another change we did make that was also somewhat helpful was we did get a bigger charger for the electric fence. We got an eight jewel one and um, that definitely made them think a little bit more about it than they did with the smaller chargers we had used on cows. Okay, so here we are at year three. So bringing in new goats, one thing we discovered over the last couple of years that was when we would bring new goats in, it takes them a substantial amount of time to adjust. Uh, that was something different from cows. You know, you can buy bred cows or you can buy open cows and you just bring them in and they adjust really quickly. And the goats take a little bit more time. They have their little herd hierarchy. They have family groups like twins often stay together and mother daughters do. And when you bring in new goats to that, it's a little stressful for them as they all work out their little pecking order. Um, and, it, and then change in feed. 
most of the goats that we've bought, I can like see on their horns right when they came and their feed changed enough. It like has a line on their horns from it. So um, even goats that we bought from not very far away still needed time to adjust. So we found if we bought them, bought the goats, brought them home, tried to breed them very quickly after that, we either had very late kidders or single babies or dry. If we bought them 60 plus days before kidding, we had a much better go at having them catch on the first cycle. So if I was buying new goats, I would try to have them on my property, getting used to you and their feed at least 60 days before you wanted to turn a buck out with them. Okay, so multiples. What We got told one time by someone we were buying goats from that they would rather have one big kid from their goats than two to three smaller kids. Well, I just wanna take a minute to look at those numbers. So if you had one kid, your, go your mama goat had a single that weighed seven, let's say you could wean that single at 70 pounds. You're gonna have 70 pounds a kid. If she has twins, let's say they're a little bit smaller at weaning time than singles would be, but let's say they're 60 pounds. You're gonna have 120 pounds come time to sell them. If you have three kids, they still, they're going to be a little bit smaller than the twins are. That's just kind of the way of life. Um, but you're still, you're going to have 150 pounds of kid to sell. So if you sold those for 250 hundred weight, or that comes out to 250 a pound. Um, here's the numbers here. Oh, one kid, you're going to end up with $175. If you have two kids, you're going to end up with the $300. If you have the three kids, you're going to end up with $375. So that's $200 more if you have smaller triplets versus um, a single larger kid. Um, the likelihood, though, is that you might not get the same price for kids that are 50 pounds and 70 pounds. Usually smaller kids, you get a little bit more per pound on them than you do if they're bigger. So let's say for that one kid that weighed 70 pounds was 250 a pound. That's still the 175. But let's say the 60 pound kids, you might get 264 suddenly that's 312. The three kids that weigh 50 pounds, um, you might get 270 a pound for them. So that's 405. So you're almost, that's more than double what a single kid was. So one of the best ways to increase profitability with the goats is to select goats that have triplets and that they can raise them unassisted. And culling any that throw singles when they're mature age um, or that won't take care of three. Because there are many goats that can and do raise good triplets. This one of these goats in this picture in this corner, we ended up, she did not like this brown one. She hated him. I don't know why. So she's not here anymore, though. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's talk about hooves. My husband laughed at me, my picture with my goat with the moon between her horns, but it was a picture I had of this goat. So this goat is chocolate chip and she probably has some of the worst feet of our goats right now. So I tried to find a picture of her. You can see a little bit her feet down here, um, how their, their angle isn't the greatest on them. And you can see here her foot is sore. She's got gumbo between her toes and she's picking up her foot. Um, hoof trimming is kind of a common health maintenance thing with goats, but it can be pretty labor intensive and take a lot of time. So ideally goats with good hooves should be retained. Um, we've gotten to a point that we do not keep some lines because of their hoof quality. Chocolate chip. I have a couple of her daughters and they don't have the greatest feet either. So now they are on a do not keep list right now. Um, sometimes their feed regimen can affect it, uh, weather conditions and the type of soil they're living on too. Okay, so using your data, take a lot of notes, take, do a lot of record keeping. I think it's really important when it comes to making decisions, especially when you're picking replacements and in culling. So for us, like I said a couple slides ago, having multiples, having triplets is a very desirable trait for us. And having poor hooves is a pretty undesirable one. Keeping all that information organized um, can be interesting, but it's really helpful when you go to make those decisions. Um, I use a program called Kintrax and I really like it. It helps organize all my data. I'm gonna show you a few screenshots from it. So here you can see um, it has all these records that I've entered in of individual animals. This is little Blackie. Um, it shows their age, their color. Um, you, can, you can look at um, 
these tabs up here, their family tree you can look at, you can look at their descendants, their any health things that you've done with them. You can enter it in pretty easily. You can like mass enter health things. So like if I give everything a vaccine, I can put all of it in at the same time. Um, here's another screenshot of all of her previous kidding. So the first year she had twins and then she had twins again and then she had triplets. And then I'm a little mad at her because the last two years she's only had boy goats and I would really like a daughter from her. So hopefully she can redeem herself in this in kidding season this year. Uh, this is shows all of her descendants. So these are all her kids she's had. I just, I don't want to delete um, the records because I want to be able to see that. So once something's died, I just put D and then the year they were born. I always name our kids when I tag them, like triplets get A, B, and C with the mother's number. That's just how I do it. Oops. Okay. And then, um, but you can see her, these are her offspring. I've kept daughters off of her and now some granddaughters even too. So it's very quickly where they can um, have multiples can really very quickly change how many you have or how many descendants you have. Okay. Weights would also be a valuable data point, um, but we haven't done that at this point yet. However, we got a scale. So if I can convince my brothers and husband, we will start weighing the goats. So we'll see what happens. Whoops. <laughs> okay. Square bales. So after converting to round bales, my grandpa crone always called these idiot cubes. So I'm a little unsure how he would feel about our choice to feed the goats this way. Goats are fairly notorious for wasting a lot of their feet. We've turned to this. Um, we're able to spread the flakes far enough apart to keep them from pooping on their neighbor's plate. Um, so that helps some. We've also used manger space with the goats. Um, continuous panel works well because they can get their heads through, but they can't crawl through. Um, but they do pull a lot of hay back and then step on it and waste it. So that's not perfect. We have also fed the goats like with a bale processor out with our cows and that works pretty good. They'll clean up stuff that the cows can't reach. Um, but most, for the most part, we use the square bales. It ends up usually kind of being in a family affair and a little bit nostalgia for the, all the times um, that they did this for all the cows. So that's what we do for hay in the winter. And that brings us to year four. Okay, finding information. So I'd like to caution if you're interested in goats of where you find your information to make sure you get good information. Um, maybe if you're gonna be taking advice from a person that's online, make sure that some of your goals are similar. Because goats are small, that means um, they can be kept on small acreage. And that means there's a lot of people with just a few acres that have a handful of goats and they like to share how they do things. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Um, but if you're wanting to be commercial with it, I would caution against using some of the similar uh, strategies if someone only has a few goats, because it might be way too labor intensive. Similarly, if you are wanting a few pet goats or dairy goats or goats just to eat the weeds from around your property, then advice from someone who's wanting to sell kids commercially might not be the best for your situation. Um, um find similar minded people i had a facebook page i really liked following for a long time um but i kind of came to the conclusion after having the goats for a while that we had just such different vastly different goals in mind that a lot of their strategies just weren't for us i didn't like the high inputs and high labor intensiveness on their goats so i found a different page um I think real world knowledge from people in a similar climate and location as you is probably some of the best information that you can get. I talked to quite a lot of people before we got into the goats um, from around here. I'm very fortunate in that our neighbors have a commercial meat goat herd. In our county, there's not a lot of people doing goats. So it's pretty awesome that our neighbors are doing it too. And I've been able to ask a lot of questions and get a lot of good advice. So Kevin and Kathy, if you guys are watching, Shout out to you guys and thank you for answering all my questions. I've messaged them a lot and they've been beyond helpful to me in this journey. Um, some, a few of my favorite online resources, if you're wanting to go read 
Uh, Onion Creek Ranch has a great website. Um, it's right there, TennesseeMeatGoats.com. They have a lot of uh, really well-organized info um, in articles about health stuff and management stuff. And they've been doing it since the 70s. They developed the Textmaster Goat, which is a cross between a Tennessee meat goat and a boer goat. Really like their website and their stuff. Uh, goats Extension, um, goats.extension.org. Again, they have a lot of articles and good information. And that's like USDA um, website. Uh, Iowa Kiko Goats, they're on Facebook. I like a lot of their um, style. So they're one of my favorite ones to follow. And then if you're in Montana, Goat Montana, uh, they're on Facebook too. And they are really good about sharing a lot of uh, education that's available. And they even have some local events. Um, they have been too far for me to go to yet, but maybe someday we will see. And that's through the university system, Goat Montana is. Okay, so Goat found Fence. This is what we found that's worked well for us. We um, have found putting up woven wire, making sure it's very tight. And then we use an electric standoff wire about six or so inches from the bottom with the high tensile wire. Putting that on the bottom prevents them from using their horns to rip up on the woven wire and thus crawl under. Um, we also put another electric wire right above the woven wire, and that prevents them from trying to jump over the woven wire. So we've repurposed some older woven wire, and we found the short stuff isn't the best suited. The taller style prevents them from jumping over much better. Um, so that's for some of our permanent fencing is what we found has worked for us. Um, temporary fencing, we have used the netting, like I mentioned. However, my caution on the terrain, it needs to be flat. Um, so for us, because we're grazing on the riverbank, we have to go from our fence down to the water. So we end up, and that's what my girls, a couple of my girls are helping me do here. They're helping me put up one of those fences. And we have usually used like a six or seven electric wire um, fence. And that can be pretty labor intensive because it's steep to put up. Um, you have to go up and down a lot. It works okay, but it's not great. It's not perfect. And we're planning to try to make some sort of kind of portable reinforced candle panel that would could be moved, but we haven't quite got that yet. So that's where we're at on our fencing adventures. <laughs> okay, trees. Goats love to eat leaves. Um, ours eat a lot of willow, cottonwood, and Russian olive tree trees. Choke cherries might be toxic at certain times. Um, I think it would be more serious if you had them in like a paddock that was very small with choke cherry trees um, that they were in for a long time and that they started really, really eating a lot on. So when we put them into a new paddock, it's usually the first thing that the goats go for is the leaves. And they can be really hard on them, um, on, the on the trees, especially, like I said, if they're in a pasture for an extended amount of time. So we have a few acres near our house that we use at kidding time and for one group at breeding time. And they've pretty much killed all of the small Russian olive trees that were in there. The larger ones are okay. The cottonwoods um, on the riverbank seem a lot less vulnerable to them, um, but the Russian olives have definitely taken a hit. So they go for the leaves first, but then they start nipping at the bark if they're bored and they'll end up girdling the trees. So if you like trees, I would suggest fencing around them if you get goats. Here's a few more pictures of the goats eating leaves. Um, They're kind of funny about it and it's a little creepy. This middle picture you can see, um, I, I took this, this is like a lot of little cottonwood trees and the goats have been in here for a little while. And so you can see the line of like how hot, tall the goats can reach. It's just like a perfect line. They'll eat all the lower leaves and then they can't reach the taller ones. Um, A few more tree pictures. So. I didn't have the greatest pictures of this, so I tried to kind of piece it together, but this is in our fishing access pasture. This one's looking north. There's a lot of willow trees. It's very, very thick. Um, I think this was the first year, this bottom right corner was the first year we used, had the goats in there. Um, it was very, pretty overgrown. 
This one's looking from the other side of the creek, looking south. Um, you can see right where the goats like have can reach. So there's that nice tree line. A lot of people use them to control trees if they're in an area that trees need to be controlled. That's not maybe so much our circumstance here, but and then in this picture, you can really see the goats aren't in that pasture anymore, but you can see that where they were and how high they could reach there. Okay, so year five. Okay, so parasites. So I've shared some of the good and some of the bad, and this is the ugly. So last year, we had a major parasite issue that hit our herd, and we ended up losing quite a few adults and babies from it. We had a really wet spring um that really contributed to the worms we had had a lot of drought in the previous years and when we were getting used to the goats and that we kind of were getting away with um probably some things that we needed to adjust um because it had been so dry we didn't have as many issues and it took us a while to figure out what was going on and we ended up having to treat a lot of our herd for worms so some of the signs include rough coats, they're losing body condition. If you have hands on them, you can look at their eyelid and it should be bright pink with blood flow. Um, pale pink or white could indicate they're losing blood. Um, we even had some that started swelling in their necks and that was from their hearts not being able to pump blood adequately um, because of all the blood loss. There's a lot of different worm types goats can have, but barber pole worm is definitely worth mentioning here. Um, all goats have some natural worm load. There's likely some sort of symbiotic relationship that the goats need some worms for their digestion and immune health. Um, so you can't like eradicate all the worms out of your goats. Um, that's not, not the goal. The goal is to manage it and keep it in check. When the load gets too large, that's when trouble occurs. So to prevent, we we're doing this before, um, our issue, but we give copper boluses a couple times a year. It's like a capsule and it's full of little copper wires um, and it gets in all the little folds in their stomach. Um, and it works well because goats need copper and the copper helps keep the worms in check. Another preventative thing is pasture rotation and just making sure that grass doesn't get too close to the ground in, if they're in for a long period of time. They eat plants from the top down um, so once they start getting to six inches, that could means there could be larva on, or there could be larva on those from crawling up the stems at that point. So rotating them out of pasture, not returning for a period of time should also help keep parasites in control. Um, we ended up treating anything with symptoms with two classes of warmer and did a repeat. And that definitely helped our situation. Um, it was kind of a tough lesson because we lost some and our kids did not weigh as much as they had in the previous years, but um, hopefully we are better moving forward from it. Okay, noxious weeds. So we have leafy spurge um, in areas where floodwaters touch from the river um, and the goats love it. They absolutely love it. And when we move them into new areas, that's one of the things they seek out first. I've tried to map locations using Onyx if I find big patches of spurge um, just to make sure that we have the goats on those spots before it sets seed. Um, we've had them in larger areas or tried to have them kind of tight in areas and they do really well on both those styles. Um, if you try to make it really intensive so that they just eat it all really good or if they're just um, in a normal sized paddock for them, they'll seek it out anyway. So it works good, pretty good either way. Um, like I, I think I'd mentioned the person that we bought our goats from had um, his to eat spotted knapweed in the mountains. Um, so I know that they will eat that too. I've also read of people that have GPS on their goats and like the goats will seek out spurge. Like they will walk to try to find the spurge. I have a little video of some of the spurge that we grazed last year. Can you hear it? Is there a sound? There is some. Here, I don't know. Okay. I can't hear it, but hopefully they can. No audio, Carmen, but maybe you can kind of just. Okay, sounds good. I'm like, I don't know if there's audio. Okay, so 
hold on. I'm going to, I'll commentate here. I'm going to start it over so I can commentate for it. Okay. So this area, we used electric netting um, and we fenced the goats onto this area. So this was, is a low area um, that there's water and there's spurge in. So in this video, um, you can see I'm touching a plant there. You can see the leaves and the white where the goats have like bitted off, but there's no florets there. Um, so that's kind of what it looked like after them being in there for a few days. Um, and then I'm going to turn, this was how much netting I had. So I couldn't get all of the spurge. And this is where, what that area looked like before the goats. So you can see there's a pretty large plant there. It's like up to my waist about with the big florets. Um, and that's what it would have looked like on the other side before the goats were turned in. Um, there's quite a few, I'm kind of pointing out a few plants here. You can see the dark green and their narrow leaves kind of down low, a lot of plants. So that's where the goats have not grazed. And then this is where the goats have grazed and it's pretty hard to find much. I know there's a floret right there that they missed, but for the most part, they seek it out and try to, they try to eat the spurge. They like the spurge. So that's been um, good use of them to try to control that. So, um, predation. So we have not had any issues with predators getting our goats. We don't live in areas with wolves or bears or mountain lions though. So the main predator around here would be coyotes or birds of prey. We have a lot of eagles on the river and I was really a little concerned about them um, at kidding time, especially, but they haven't been an issue. Uh, during the summer months, I do keep electricity to keep the goats in. And so that can help some with the coyotes too. So a couple of these pictures, these were a couple of vulnerable goats that did not die, even though they were vulnerable. So this one was our late kidder on the left. Um, it was time to get everyone out to pasture. So she just had to handle it herself on the river and she did great. And she had fresh new babies quite a ways away from our house and she did good. And there was no coyotes. Um, this was Johnny. He ended up falling down a drift onto the riverbank, um, onto the river when it was frozen and couldn't get back out. So he was separated and he also was okay. So uh, I think with that, yeah, I mean, you kind of just got, you got to know your area. So talking to people from where you're at is probably a good thing. Um, goats do have horns and they will use them to protect themselves. Um, our goats have horns and like the mama goats, especially like at kidding time, they're, they can be kind of aggressive at dogs. Like some of them just won't let dogs close, but others will like come from across the pasture um, very <laughs> violently to try to throttle the dogs and get them out. So they, they, um, they'll stand up for themselves. And I think in that way, they're a little different than sheep. Although, like I said, I have very little knowledge on sheep. Um, a lot of people use livestock guardian dogs and, but I've read about people having problems with them too. Um, we just had a hard time justifying the cost of buying and feeding them if they're not actually um, if we're not actually losing stock from predation. So I would say that you don't necessarily have to have guardian dogs with goats. Um, every location and circumstance is going to vary, but our electricity has been good for us and we haven't had an issue. Another good thing about the goats is they are pretty weather hardy. Um, the majority of our goats only have natural shelter our wean dolings do have access to a barn where we keep them at my dad's, but the mature ones live at my place. Um, they have a lot of tree shelter. I mean, if they don't kill all the trees, they have a lot of tree shelter. Um, they're very heat tolerant. They love it when it was a drought and it was dry and hot. They were just like laying out on the gumbo creek banks, chewing their cud, soaking up the rays. Um, they like that. They, they hate getting wet. Rain will make them sprint for cover even just a little bit of rain. Um, they do well in winter. They do really well in winter and cold with their fluffy cashmere coats. Wet snow is probably the hardest on them. Um, the picture on the left shows that was from a year we had a lot of snow and how deep it is. 
and they did pretty well. Um, we did lose a couple during, we had a very extreme weather event, a negative 76 degree wind chill, negative 52, and we've lost a handful that way. Um, to be fair, we also lost cows during some of those events. So I'd say for the size of them, they're pretty hardy and you don't necessarily have to have a farm to keep them in. Here's some of the baby goats, oops, playing on the gumbo uh, riverbank there in the heat of the summer. Okay, another positive thing about the goats has been working with the sixth generation. So some of these pictures of my kids and nieces and nephews, and it has been really fun that the kids can be very hands-on with the goats. They are very excited about kidding time with the little baby goats. Um, that picture on the left is my crew, my four kids and me out taking baby goats. Um, they can get really involved and it's very safe for them to do so. Um, they are learning about caring for animals and um, getting them into pens and sorting and that sort of thing um, in a safer way than if they're in with really large animals. So that's been a really um, fun part of having the goats. My daughter, Lucy, on the in the middle there, uh, she would come out before school every day last kidding season at 6 a.m. to check. And she's like, don't, don't let, don't go out without me. So that's been a fun part of the goats too. That's been a big positive. Okay. And that is the end of my presentation. So stop share. Okay. The red button on your left screen. Thank you. Tremendous job, Carmen. That was super fun. So okay. we've got some questions. Uh, we're getting those queued up. But my first question for you is, you talk about your kids enjoying it. You've got names like Chocolate Chip. <laughs> How are you, do you wait until you know that it's something that you're not going to sell before you name it? When do you let that attachment yeah, take? Yeah, no, that the kids definitely name them. Um, That was like one of the first goats born. Sugar and Chocolate Chip were their names. So Nah, we name them and they go down the road and um, it's kind of been an okay experience talking with my girls about that. We had one of my daughter's goats um, ended up getting really sick and she didn't do very well with the parasites last year, Lucy's. And I was worried about keeping her because she lost her kids and I didn't really want to keep her because it probably wasn't the best strategy to keep something around. So we talked about it and she's like, well, mom, what about next year? Will she be able to keep her babies alive? And I'm like, I don't know. That's a risk. And she's like, well, if I sell her, can I keep another replacement? Because I let them keep one as, to call theirs. And I said, okay. So she kept two this year. So it was okay. I mean, of course, there's going to be some emotions with that, but it's been okay for as far as uh, kind of opening those conversations up with our kids. So Tough ranch kid lessons. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a question from Lauren and she says, have you been able to use stockmanship to train the goats or control that boss doe? Um, use stockmanship. Is that what she said? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so not completely yet. I would say it is kind of interesting. Our dynamic, um, has changed as one of our Bostos that we used to have, we don't have anymore. And I would say there's certain ones that are kind of in charge that are worse about getting out. I had some that decided when the river froze, they would just cross the ice. Um, even though they were like not kept near the river bank at that point, they would seek it out to go, I don't know what, find something on the other side that was super desirable. So no, I don't have experience with that. I think that you probably could do some training with them, um, but I just have not been able to get a handle on that yet. Next question is that uh, Nicole says she would love to hear more about your protocol on treating the lice or the mites. Yeah, so um, when we had those ones get sick, um, they kind of took some multiple applications. I think we ended up giving an injectable ivermectin to the one that almost died um, because she just wasn't coming out of it. Since we've been doing, um, we use cleanup, like the spray that we use on our cows too. Uh, 
since we've been doing that kind of more preventatively and proactively, we haven't had any severe cases since then. So it's usually right around this time of year that we treat them for that. So that was my question to Carmen with the, the parasites, with the lice, knowing that, you know, I was thinking other livestock, can that pass along, but also your kids, since your kids are so hands-on you <laughs> have to worry about that aspect. Um, I almost had a stroke because I found goat lice in my children and I have good news. Goat lice are different than human lice and they can't suck human blood. So thankfully we haven't had an issue from that. <laughs> This is where the nursing background comes yeah. in. Yeah, I, I did have to look it up, though, because I didn't learn that in nursing school that, like, you know, goat lice is not the same as people lice. But now I know that. So, so we've got a, a couple of questions here when it comes to the electric that you're using. And somebody wants to know if you can use too much charge, saying that they worked at a place that used 13 kV chargers for fences for cattle. And they are wondering if that might be a little bit too much for goats. Um, I don't think so. So, but ours is eight and that, um, I've got shocked a few times and it is not fun experience. So it has some bite to it, but we've also seen baby goats get zapped by it and they're fine. So I feel like they'll be okay. Um, like we pretty little ones have gotten zapped by it and, uh, no lasting harm. So I, I got zapped can... when I was at your parents' house because I was too close. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's memorable. <laughs> it wasn't too bad. Okay. <laughs> and then um, along those lines, any thoughts on the electric collars for your Bostos? Yes. Okay. I have looked into the electric collars and I'm very intrigued by them. I think coats would be a really interesting um, species to use them with. And that Iowa Kiko goats does use them some. Um, my issue is the cost, um, how much it costs to keep um, those going. That's kind of been my holdup on it. I've wondered too, um, if you could just put it on, you know, a few, like those big bossy ones that are being the troublemakers and if that would control everyone or not, I'm not sure couple of health-related questions. Again, uh, Megan asks if you've had any issues when you banned your bucks with UTIs. Um, We did have one that had an issue from that. We lost one. He got the urinary calculi and um, died from it. That was one. It was kind of a little bit of an odd experience or odd situation in that his mom kitted really late, like in November. And then we banded him kind of like our normal, what I do, I ban the bucks like as early to when they're born as possible within the first few days of life, because it's a lot less stressful on them. That one though, he was born late in November. And then we, what we realized probably was part of the problem that we got an issue with the urinary calculi was because he couldn't reach the water because he was little. And usually in the summertime, um, we're along bodies of water and that the babies can get water from too versus out of the water tank um, that we were using at that time. So we had him during the winter and he probably did, was shorted a little bit on water was probably what kind of contributed to it. We haven't had any issue on our ones that have been born in the springtime. I usually ban them within the first few days of life. And then we haven't had any issues and we sell them in like October timeframe. I think that you can have issues if you try to keep um, weathers around like long-term or longer. Like if you want them to get bigger, you gotta be careful on that, on the urinary calculi on those older ones. So you mentioned the water, Carmen, and that was a question as well. Um, we've got Janice saying, do you graze up to the water and do the goats try to cross? Have any drowned? Um, no. So we, it's like a moat. It's the best goat fencing we have is the river. <laughs> they hate the water. They don't want to cross it. We have never had any adults cross it. Um, we have had, I don't think that we've had any drown in it that I know of. Um, we had a few missing this year, but I accounted that to our parasite issue. 
Um, so I don't think that we've had any drown. In years past, I've had everybody accounted for. So I knew that none drowned it. I knew the coyotes got none. And this last year we had a few missing, but I don't think they drowned. We actually had one. Um, it was a baby one and it was my daughter Nellie's goat bunny's baby. And he must have at some point last summer fell in and swam. And when he swam, he swam across to the rivers or to the neighbors. Well, they saw him, but then he left and they're like, oh, he must have gone back where he belonged. But they hate water so much like this baby goat was on the wrong side of the river, but would not cross willingly back. He must have fallen in like they, they're like a cat, like they can swim if they had to have to, but they don't want to. And he lived over there um, for a couple months by himself, just on the wrong side. And um, when we moved the goats, like we moved them shortly after that time. So like then we were like in the wrong spot. So I could never see him or hear him at that point. But um, yeah, the water is a good, good barrier. Even our creek that's not as big, um, they won't cross unless they can jump it. Just wild and out there on his own for a few months. Yeah, yeah, just <laughs> living the life. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a couple of questions linked back to health again. Um, have you ever tried diatomaceous earth for parasites? I have not. I have not. I've read about people doing that. Um, but I personally have not. And then this is kind of like the the question of lice on your littles, but when you're running in conjunction with cattle, are there illnesses that can be passed between the two or other issues that could arise from commingling goats with other livestock? Um, I don't like the parasites are, I believe, hear me out. I believe our specific, we don't run ours um, together like during the summertime, but like some people use that as a strategy, like the, like horses, um, or cows can like eat the larva and then they die because they don't have, they can't like implant on the on goat, like they do on the goats. So um, I'm not sure about the mites, if the mites are passable, but the goats are like very, the goat lice are very specific to the goat species, apparently. Couple of questions, it looks like linked to feed. So I've got uh, Leslie asking, what mineral are you feeding aside from the copper boluses? And then Christine saying, do you feed grain such as oats, molasses, barley mix to your goats or only hay? And do you creep feed? Oh, okay. So we do not creep feed the kids or the goats. Um, I'll answer the feed one first, I guess. Okay. So the feed, we at some points give them MXP pellets, which I believe is like a wheat mid uh, mixture from that we get locally here. Uh, we don't feed that all the time to them, but we do feed it to them about a month before we put our bucks in. Um, we try to do what we call flush them and you want them to be on like an uptake of calories and you want them to be gaining um, when you first turn the bucks out so that that way their body is like, we got the food, we got the feed, let's make three babies instead of one baby. So. We try to like increase their nutrition at that point. Um, we've done both MXP pellets or just boosted them with like uh, alfalfa hay. Um, third cutting alfalfa is what we use this year. The minerals, we have tried to give them some um, sea salt lately because my husband is on a kick of that with the cows. So we've tried it with the goats too, and they don't love it. Um, but we don't have a major mineral program right now. That's kind of what we're doing at the moment. So we've got a, a comment here from Megan. She says that it's interesting that you banned your goats so early. They show goats and they typically banned about six weeks. Okay. So personal yeah. preference there, I'm sure. Yeah. So part of the personal preference is they can be really hard to catch after um, <laughs> they're very big. We don't have a lot of like working facilities because of we're kind of new at this. So we found it's just easier to just to do it right when they're they're born. I kid them close to my house, but then by the time they're six weeks old, they're like a mile away on the riverbank. Um, so it's that's just not feasible for or feasible for our situation. And we haven't had issue with it. You know, there is goat yoga. There could be goat chasing at your place as like oh, yeah. a fitness <laughs> ask. 
You can charge people. <laughs> yes. Pick an event. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anybody has any more questions, please drop them into the chat and we'll get those of Carmen. Carmen, I don't think that I have ever tried goat meat. So what is it similar to um, how much I, I mean, I've gotten a, a lamb at a fair before and it feels like it's such a small amount of meat compared to what I'm used to with butchering a beef. I can imagine a goat is, is much smaller than that even. How much yeah. meat do you get? What's it taste like? Um, okay. So we haven't been big into sampling the goats either, but I have tried goat. We had some like goat Thuringer from some neighbors. Um, people compare it more to beef. It's like a dark, it's a red meat and it's darker. So sometimes like sweet, more sweet is what they'll describe it as. But I am not like an expert at cooking goats. They aren't real big. So no, like they'd be smaller than lambs. Like when we sell them at market, like, um, a little bit de depends on preference. Like you can wait um, till they're a year or two old. Like some people like them to get bigger so they have more meat and they have more a different flavor. But a lot of them, like I think get, um, they'll get slaughtered like when they're like 80, 90 pounds, 70, 80, 90 is like done for some people. So you said that you bring them to pays and billings. That's where you do the sales. How often, I know that this isn't like an every week thing. How often do they do sales? Is it, you know, one big one in the fall? How does that marketing go? Yep. So the same day as the sheep sales um, is goat sales too. So they're once a month right now, this time of year. Um, but in the fall, when a lot of people are bringing stuff in, they're usually twice a month, like starting in September, October, November, they have them twice a month. So we usually try to hit one in October timeframe. How do you haul them? Um, just in our stock trailer. Uh, we haven't got to a point that we can't fit our goats in our like stock trailer that we use for um, our cows. Some people, once they get, if they don't have enough space, they can put, you can put decking and just make it like a two levels and haul them in the trailer. They would just so look so little in a stock trailer. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do look little in a stock trailer. <laughs> Sometimes we throw some up in the nose too, because we can <laughs> haul a few more that way. So I've got a couple of questions on what the goats eat as far as, you know, not what you're feeding them, but their extracurricular eating. And uh, so we've got somebody asking in regards to trees, do they eat pine species like juniper? And then also do they eat brush like sagebrush or buckbrush? Um, they love the sagebrush. They love that. Um, this is probably one of my weaknesses knowing all these plants. So I don't really know what buck brush is, but um, they really like like shrubs. Like that's definitely a favorite of theirs. Um, we don't have a lot of pine trees here, but we've fed them Christmas trees before and they love the needles on the Christmas trees. I really wanted to take my goats to like my mother-in-law's cabin in the little Rockies. And then I saw them destroy a Christmas tree. And I was like, she will hate me forever because they will like destroy her trees at her cabin. So my dream was changed, but, um, they can eat pine needles. I know that cows, it can be an issue for them aborting, but it doesn't seem to be an issue with the goats from what I've read. Anyway, we don't have enough to like really be concerned about it, but yeah, they'll eat pine needles too. We've got Daniel says, sorry, I joined late. Don't know if this was covered earlier. I don't think it was, but have you had to deal with joint or navel ill? No, we have not. We haven't and had that issue. Dave added that a 70 pound LW goat yields about 12 to 15 pounds of meat. Okay. LW, I'm not sure what that abbreviation is for because I'm not in the goat world. <laughs> maybe she meant L maybe she meant LB for pound, maybe. Okay. And then um why personally did you guys opt to go to goats as opposed to sheep? Um, you know, I was wondering that a little bit when we were like kind of remembering this, trying to remember why when I was putting together this presentation. And I think our terrain is really why we kind of decided to go with the goats um, because of how steep it is like along the riverbank. And since they like that. Also, at that point, when we got them, they were the market for the goats was a lot stronger than the sheep market, too. So I think those were kind of a couple of the factors. 
Carmen, fun discussion. And uh, for folks that joined us late in the show, we'll be putting this up on our, our YouTube channel tomorrow or over the weekend, and we'll send out a link to all of our attendees. So thanks everyone for joining us. Have a good night. Bye.